Let me call uh, the hearing to order. Uh, just for my colleagues' awareness, so uh, we intend to conclude today's hearing as we did yesterday by 12 o'clock noon due to Senate floor business. And this will require us ending the open session by 11 a.m. and then moving immediately to the closed session, SVC 217. As such, I would ask that members adhere to the five-minute rule. I will enforce it. Uh, and then uh, I will waive my opening statement, and I, Senator Wicker also has graciously agreed to waive his opening statement. So with that, let me recognize Secretary Granholm for her statement, and then Administrator Ruby, Madam okay. Secretary. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and. Um, I'll be quick about my opening statement uh, to try to uh, be in the spirit of uh, moving with alacrity. Uh, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Wicker, of course, the esteemed members of the committee, honored to be here representing the Department of Energy before you today. Uh, I thank this committee for the strong, consistent, bipartisan sh support. Uh, the committee has shown the Department of Energy, the NNSA, uh, on our collective mission. For the past three years, uh, Congress has entrusted DOE with significant resources to build up America's manufacturing capacity, to create jobs, to lead global clean energy markets, and those endeavors are critical to energy security and economic competitiveness in the 21st century. And at the same time, the American people have long counted on the department to meet essential national security missions. The geopolitical shifts around us have made clear that those missions are urgent as ever. The growing cooperation between Russia, China, Iran, North Korea has created a more unstable and less predictable international environment, increased saber rattling, aggression against our allies, and cyber attack threats reinforce the imperative to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Meanwhile, more and more countries around the world are embracing the potential of, of civil nuclear power for sustainable development, for zero carbon energy, and for climate security. In fact, in December, 22 nations pledged to triple civil nuclear generation capacity by 2050. And interest is only set to grow as these small modular reactors and advanced reactors continue to progress. All of this underscores a need for deeper investment and innovation in nonproliferation and counterterrorism measures. And as nuclear technology continues to develop, we must uphold our pledges to the communities that have lived alongside those programs for decades. So the department has worked urgently to deliver on each of these priorities over the past year. And the president's budget request for 2025 will empower us to make even greater progress. Just want to detail quickly some of the key elements, starting with the NNSA. The FY25 budget calls for $25 billion, which is a 3.6% increase over the 24 enacted level. That includes a roughly 4% increase for weapons activities, which will allow us to move more swiftly toward modernizing the nuclear stockpile and restoring production capacity. This request would also empower the NNSA to respond to new threats and opportunities under nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism. It will allow us to continue providing the Navy with nuclear propulsion systems while developing the next generation of nuclear-powered warships. Both are vital to our technological advantage over our adversaries and preserving free glo global oceans. And importantly, the budget will also allow the NNSA to build the, the federal workforce that's needed to meet our increasing mission requirements. Further, the president has requested uh, $8.2 billion for our Office of Environmental Management, which oversees the largest environmental cleanup operation in the world. Last year, our teams across the country made great progress on key demolitions and treating and relocating millions of gallons of tank waste, addressing contamination issues across our sites. The 20, uh, FY25 request will allow us to build on those results and deepen our engagement with tribes and communities as they plan for the future of those sites. And it will help us recruit and, re and train a new cohort of legacy management workers and leaders. Over the past three years, we've made important progress on each of these crucial missions, yet challenges do remain. This budget request prepares us for the depth of the work that's still ahead. I'm proud to lead such a gifted and 
dedicated teams, starting with the great leader to my left, Dr. Jill Ruby, who heads the NNSA and who is here to answer questions about the weapons uh, program. We are both grateful to have your partnership and support on these indispensable matters, and I look forward uh, to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Administrator Ruby, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reed, uh, Ranking Member Wicker, and Could you bring that microphone as close as possible? Thank you. Uh, and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear before you with Secretary Granholm to discuss the Department of Energy's enduring national security missions. NNSA appreciates the consistent strong support for our work and our workforce from the Secretary and from the committee. In today's complex and dynamic security environment, NNSA is delivering. Last year, we provided the Department of Defense over 200 modernized weapons on schedule. The life of ship nuclear reactor for the Columbia class submarine is on track for lead ship delivery. Our nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism programs are advancing technologies and partnerships that are responsive to the evolving global environment. In all our programs, we are preparing for the future by revitalizing our infrastructure and staying at the cutting edge in select science and technology areas. NNSA's FY25 budget request of $25 billion reflects these priorities. The nuclear weapons program of record grew from five to seven systems this past year. The B61 and the W88 Alt-370 programs are in production. The W80-4 remains aligned with the Air Force schedule for the long-range standoff missile, and we expect a first production unit in September 2027. The W87-1 is currently um, scheduled to begin production in fiscal year 2031 or, or 2032, and the W93 remains on track for production starting in the mid-2030s. With the fiscal year 2024 budget enactment, NNSA began working on the B-6113 program with a first production unit expected in fiscal year 26. Although the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, or SLICM in is not in the budget request for FY25 due to the timing of the FY24 NDAA, NNSA is committed to fulfilling this requirement. These seven systems represent modernized weapons for all three legs of the triad, and new capabilities responsive to today's security environment. NNSA is also modernizing our infrastructure alongside our programs. We have prioritized investments to deliver the most urgently needed capabilities while pursuing a longer term strategy of responsive, flexible, and resilient enterprise. Tangible progress on both large and smaller scale projects is being made. A milestone anticipated this year is the first diamond-stamped war reserve W87-1 plutonium pit from the Los Alamos pit production facility. In short, NNSA is delivering on programs that holistically support nuclear deterrence and strengthen relationships with our allies and partners. There is much work ahead. We are fully committed, and we appreciate your support. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Administrator Ruby. As I indicated before, my statement and Senator Wicker's statement will be uh, put in the record without objection. Um, Secretary Granholm, uh, the construction programs of the National Nuclear Security Administration and the cleanup programs at the former defense sites have been faced with large increases in costs due to a sh shortage of skilled workers and especially materials, you, like everybody else, have been caught up in the post-pandemic uh, supply disruption. Uh, what we're seeing now, however, is uh, the effects of uh, the last several years seem to be spreading to the workforce, where uh, there's indications that uh, people are leaving faster than normal retirement suggests. And now, last year, as you know, we provided uh, special authorities for the department to hire engineers and scientists. Uh, can you fill us in on how serious this problem is and if you need additional help? Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. And thank you for the uh, ability to use that flexibility. Um, 400 additional accepted service 
hiring positions allowed us to be much more flexible. We've been focusing on bringing aboard the additional 500 federal employees over the last two years that we've been able to hire. But unfortunately, um, double-digit attrition has eaten up those, those gains. And that is largely due, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, to incredible competition from the private sector and salaries from the private sector, remote work that the private sector is able to offer that we are not able to, but also because the employees feel, um, many employees have uh, reported that they feel overworked because of the loss of uh, fellow employees. So, so to answer your question, yes, support for what we have requested uh, in, our, in our budget, which is the full federal salaries and expenses appropriation, request of 564 million in FY25 would be uh, most uh, welcome um, because the appropriations for NNSA uh, as measured by enacted appropriations have really, uh, the, the national security program has really doubled in size. We've not been uh, able to keep up uh, in terms of hiring and uh, the STEM workers are obviously very special and very uh, well-educated. We've got to do everything we can to keep the greatest minds in the federal government and so the ability to hire and uh, through, as evidence through support for that uh, appropriation would be much appreciated. Uh, do, you do, do you need additional support in that uh, uh, ex exemption from uh, government rules? Um, you're good right now, right? Yeah, we appreciate what you've done uh, to date. And when we, if we get a budget appropriated, uh, we also have made changes to our hiring practices to lean forward more. So we're hopeful we can help solve this uh, shortage. And uh, Director Ruby, um, many of your production facilities date from 1940s and 1950s. Um, and you're still relying on, for example, uh, for the production of depleted uranium, a uh, World War II era rolling mill. What, and more importantly, when will you bring modern production capabilities and methods into your complex to save time and money? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, our production facilities are, in fact, uh, very old, and we're making uh, great strides in replacing them. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do. And I want to talk about, um, in particular, modernizing our capabilities and not just our uh, infrastructure. Uh, I'm sure we'll get lots of questions on infrastructure, but this issue of what our, our production capabilities are is really important uh, because any change we make in a manufacturing process changes the microstructure of materials. And we need to make sure that that's okay through our science programs. But we have some great examples. In fact, we have a special polymer uh, part that we produce due to using additive manufacturing for the W80-4 that's making a huge difference in that program. Uh, we have a current pilot project for new manufacturing technologies for radiation cases, which is a collaboration between our design and production um, agencies. Uh, we've asked our uh, advisory committee uh, to look at, it's called the Advisory Committee for Nuclear Security, to study materials and manufacturing and look for other places that we can make changes in our processes and our materials. Uh, and of course, as we build new facilities, we're looking to put modern equipment in those facilities. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. It is, in fact, true that we uh, have very old equipment and very old facilities, but we're very focused on changing that. I can't resist. Uh, if you watched the movie Oppenheimer, did you recognize facilities that are still working? <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Senator Worker, please. Madam Administrator, how many times did you see Oppenheimer? Three so far. Okay. <laughs> uh, on the Slickums, um, the the. NDAA was passed in December and signed into law immediately. Um, that, didn't, that didn't give you time to, um, um, to, to put the um, silicums in the budget. Yeah, we, uh, that is exactly right. Uh, we intend to resolve this problem uh, with Congress. Uh, it's in our unfunded requirements uh, letter, but 
We didn't get the end. We were do. We submitted the FY25 budget before the NDAA and before the enactment of the 24 budget. Okay, so you we you don't mean to slow this down another year? Absolutely not. Okay, we've established a program right. office. We're working with the Navy. We're Good. committed. Well, that that is uh, very positive news. Now, I bet you read the Congressional Strategic Posture Commission report more than three times. Studied it thoroughly. Is that right? That is correct. Indicates to uh, some of us that our nuclear forces are undersized, underprioritized, and incapable of adapting to modern times. What do you say to that? Undersized, right. Well, I, I believe that the Strategic Posture Commission report is right um, on the, the fact that we have to prepare for two near-peer adversaries or two peer adversaries, and we need to do it with a sense of urgency. Uh, and uh, and we, uh, we've taken steps already, in uh, fact. Un undersized right now, seriously. Uh, what, what the, what the report said, and I think this is important, is we need more and or different kinds, and I agree with that. I don't think just more is gonna solve the problem. Uh, so I think it's the combination of those two things. Uh, what about incapable of adapting to modern threats? Uh, we, uh, there's lots of evidence that we're slow to adapt to modern threats. Uh, but I think we're proving we're capable, uh, and we're making some changes now uh, to do that. I think the insertion of the two programs within the program of record in the last eight months uh, shows that we're able to we're able to do some adaptation. But we do need a stronger industrial base, and we need a stronger government base in the NNSA to enable us to do more as we go forward. Uh, well, a amen to that. Do you worry that? Um but tardiness on our part might encourage our allies to move forward independently of us and that that would um, have a negative effect. I, uh, yes, I would say I do, uh, I do think about that and I worry about that. Uh, so far, we, I mean, we are actually modernizing the first program you know, off the block uh, since, uh, since we started uh, re doing life extension programs is the B-6112, a forward deployed weapon, which is being placed in, in Europe now. Uh, but we need to keep up with, we need to, to, to address our allies' concerns. I think we have, and we will continue to, but yeah, we ought to, we ought to be watching it closely. Um, thank you. Madam Secretary, um, you agree that making nuclear power uh, part of the solution is uh, is a priority, do you not? I do. And to make this work, we need to rebuild a domestic nuclear fuel cycle. What steps can we take to accelerate our efforts to restart a uranium enrichment capability that can meet our civilian energy and military requirements? Um, thank you for the question, and I'm so grateful to Congress for supplying uh, $2.7 billion that has been repurposed from the civil nuclear credit uh, part of the bipartisan infrastructure law for the buildup and the creation of a, uh, an, a uranium um, cycle in the United States, a fuel, fuel cycle. But we can't access that funding unless there is a ban on import of Russian uranium into the United States. And so um, to the extent that Congress uh, can uh, adopt a ban, I think uh, one has been passed in the House, and hopefully the Senate can take that up as well. That will enable us to access uh, that funding to create a domestic supply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Worker. Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and it's good to see both of you. Secretary Granholm, I always enjoy our opportunities to do events in Virginia together. We've had some good ones. I want to ask about a topic that you raised in your joint written testimony, and that is trying to develop strategies to counter uncrewed aerial systems. Uh, we've had testimony in this hearing, public testimony from General Guio of NORTHCOM, about the uh, drone swarms around Langley, which are troubling. Those have been publicly reported and discussed in open session, but I noticed in your joint written testimony that you talked about uh, NNSA trying to kind of up its game in developing counter UAS uh, strategies. Can you talk to the committee a little bit about that? 
Absolutely, thank you for that question. Uh, this has been an issue at uh, some of our sites. We have um, identified the UAS's uh, near, near areas where uh, that are sensitive. Um, here's what we, we have UAS detection systems deployed at all of our sites. They have some limited capability to uh, counter those systems. We're updating this, the current systems and we're evaluating a new system that has much more uh, counter capability. Uh, we're testing that, we're establishing a test site uh, at Idaho uh, so, so that we can keep up with the threat. Uh, my intention, and I've been very clear about this with the, uh, with the complex, is as soon as a UAS crosses the line that we have declared as this is dangerous, we need to counter it. We can't just say we see it, we have to counter it, and we're positioning ourselves in this budget request and in the work that we're doing uh, to make sure uh, we can do that. Can I, can I ask you, as, as we are trying to grapple with this threat, um, I, I've sometimes not been satisfied as I've asked questions about sort of who's in charge of this. I mean, on domestic soil, the FBI is involved and DHS is involved, but then DOD is involved. You have to work with, you know, the, the cities and towns and counties where facilities are located. Um, is the NNSA sort of at a, at a table of stakeholders with others trying to figure this out um, from a whole of government standpoint? Uh Yes, we do work closely, especially with the FBI. Uh, I will say that we benefit from having large remote sites. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, we've clearly delineated where the lines are in terms of our sensitivities. Uh, and so we are working towards policies that allow us to take action without needing to get uh, we need that policy approved by everybody, but once we have the policy approved, we can take action without getting additional approvals. That, that's the end goal that we're looking for. Thank you. Um, switching gears, this committee and the Foreign Relations Committee have been pretty involved in putting into law the AUKUS framework, both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Talk to me about uh, NNSA's involvement in working with the Australians on the Pillar 1. Uh, equipping them with the capacity to operate and maintain and eventually to construct nuclear subs? Well, <laughs> we have two activities in NNSA on Pillar 1. There's the activities that we do in naval reactors and there's the activities we do in nonproliferation. In the naval reactors program, uh, they we have Australian uh, sailors now taking nuclear reactor training. That's the, for us, for our role, that's the most important thing is to make sure that the Australian Navy has the capability and the complete uh, thorough training that we enjoy in the U.S. to operate these boats uh, effectively. On the nonproliferation side, our goal is to have this be a model program for nonproliferation. Uh, we have lots of work with the Australians to help them understand what that is uh, and to work with the IAEA to create systems to make sure that there could be absolutely no diversion. We're going to we're going to deliver sealed nuclear reactors that power these boats, uh, but still we will need to uh, make sure there's no material diversion, no potential for uh, any material being uh, stolen um, in any way. And the, uh, we feel very confident that the Australians are taking this seriously and are working very closely with us. Excellent. Well, I don't want to exceed my time after having been warned by the chair that we're going to try to move quickly, but Secretary Granholm, I'm going to ask you a question for the record. Last year, you talked about some initiatives the Department of Energy is doing to find a talent at HBCUs and minority-serving institutions and partnership you're creating. I'll ask for the record, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, uh, what is the progress on that front. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Cain. Senator Fisher, please. Thank you, Chairman Reed, and thank you, Ranking Member Wicker. Uh, nuclear deterrence is the backbone of our national security. It underpins every operational plan that we have, and every administration since the 1960s has validated the need for our nuclear triad. While the Air Force and the Navy are responsible for the bombers, ICBMs, missiles, and submarines, it is the NNSA and the Department of Energy who are responsible for the designing, manufacturing, and certifying of the nuclear weapons themselves. 
Transitioning back towards a production mindset has its challenges, but I understand an NSA delivered over 200 modernized nuclear weapons last year, and I'm glad to see that progress is being made, Administrator, and that NNSA is reprioritizing the production and delivery of nuclear weapons. Administrator, how would this budget request help NNSA to meet their requirement to increase the number of modernized nuclear weapons produced and delivered in FY25 and beyond? Thank you, Senator Fisher. Um, we appreciate uh, your recognizing that we have made significant accomplishments. Uh, I would, <clears throat> this budget request for FY25 has about, has actually more money for production modernization than it has for stockpile modernization in it. That's not because we're not doing stockpile modernization. We're, have, we're very focused on that. But we recognize to meet the demands over the next decade and beyond, we really have to get after our production enterprise. And in particular, a lot of the emphasis is on making sure we can bring up pit production at both Los Alamos and Savannah River complete the uranium processing facility and other high priorities uh, in, in the system. So uh, I think that the most important thing that NNSA can do to secure the future for, <clears throat> for the nuclear enterprise is to develop success like we are in modernizing weapons and then modernize our infrastructure. When we visited before this hearing, um, we talked about balancing those seven modernization programs and how we really can't afford any further delays on any of those. To avoid uh, similar boom and bust cycles in the future, we have to have uh, that groundwork laid now, the foundation laid now. Can you tell me how NNSA is working with STRATCOM to assess future threats in the late 2030s and beyond to be able to identify the likely requirements for future nuclear weapons programs? Um, yes, yeah, Senator, thank you. This is one of the things I'm very proud to say that we've made a, a significant working with General Cotton we have agreed that we really need to define those needs beyond the mid-2030s, which is where the program of record today, we've got seven things going on between now and the mid-2030s, but we have we know we have needs beyond that. And we've reestablished a process that had gone, that used to exist, it had gone quiet, uh, to have STRATCOM uh, staff who understand and think about deterrence needs on a daily basis to work with our staff who think about and understand capabilities on a daily basis to work together more closely on, uh, to meet regularly to define, hey, what is the gap and what's the best way to fill it that will exist in the tw late 2030s and 2040s? You know, I've really appreciated our discussions on how we can accelerate the delivery of Slickum. And I've appreciated that you have that request in the unfunded priority list for $70 million for Slickham. I think that does demonstrate a really clear commitment to meeting the requirements that are now set in law. Administrator, can you provide us with an update on how the NNSA is moving forward with the development of the warhead? Yes. Uh, what are... are <clears throat> we are looking, working very closely with the Navy as they define their delivery platform to define the warhead that will match well to that. Our objective, because we're trying to do this in, in the program of record, we're trying to you know, squeeze it between some programs that we are already working on, is to find the most effective and simplest way that won't disrupt the rest of the program of record to meet the requirements for Slickham in. So we're looking at the W80-4, as was in the authorizing language. We're also looking at other options that might, uh, that might we don't know yet, uh, be simpler to do in terms of disrupting our current production flow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Fisher. Senator Manchin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both for your service and for being here. I appreciate it very much. And Senator Graham Hold, uh, Granholm uh, blessed us yesterday with her presence, and we had a good meeting, <laughs> except for a little interruption. But other than that, it was good. 
but I want to thank you all. I've been a long supporter and, and a fan of nuclear and basically with nuclear uh, propulsion has been used in nuclear in weapons, but mostly in propulsion for our uh, military fleet, Department of Defense, and how we've done such a safety record for many, 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 many years. But yet we haven't been able to get it right in the, in, in the uh, uh, private sector, or we haven't been able to em employ it with the same, I think, the same veracity and, and also the assurances from the public that we can do it in a very safe manner. And I think that's been a mistake on our part. I'm concerned, really, uh, and to both of you, how you might feel about this, uh, the production of highly enriched uranium, hey you. And uh, its primary fuel source for the Navy submarines, aircraft carriers, as we know, according to NNSA, enriched uranium stockpile will run out in 2040. I'm, uh, is that accurate? Or is those timelines accurate? And you're concerned? And what do you plan to do to uh, make sure that we don't have a, a deficiency there? Uh, thank you, Senator Manchin. Uh, uh, let's see. We have uh, two needs in NNSA for enriched uranium. We have the need for low enriched uranium to make tritium. That is the that is a focus for the 2040s, and we they have a need for highly enriched uranium for uh, naval reactors and weapons, which is uh, uh, which is out beyond the 2040s time frame. Uh, we do not have the capability to uh, enrich uh, uranium for defense purposes in, in the U.S. today. Let me, uh, let me, can I, for a little bit of history, and it might help us all a little bit of history here, why did we allow ourselves to get in a situation that we were dependent upon Russia or we went to that? It was after the Cold War. I've heard different scenarios. In the Cold War, then we're trying to all just kind of work work together. But why did we believe? Was it basically from an environmental standpoint, or do we have a lot of... Uh, advocates who were opposed to nuclear, and we thought, well, out of sight, out of mind, we'll go somewhere else and get it. Didn't want to produce it here and enrich it. What was the purpose? What was the problem? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think there are a couple uh, issues. So with respect to defense needs, we have a lot, and we had a lot. We had, you know, we had a stockpile of 30,000 weapons. Um, in the nuclear weapon stockpile, highly enriched uranium doesn't get used. So it stays highly enriched. It has a very long lifetime. So we felt there was plenty of highly enriched uranium that could be used, and in fact, even downblended to low enriched uranium to use for other purposes. And that's what we've been doing now for many decades. In the civil sector, of course, it's a different issue, which is uh, a, a cost competition and uh, environmental issues. It, it was hard to create a steady base for civil nuclear uh, in, uh, uh, LEU. Mm -hmm. But on the, on, the, on the defense side, we have been using our stockpile of HEU from weapons, and it's just now as we plan out that we feel like we cannot continue to do that forever and that we need to think about reestablishing these capabilities. And Senator Granholm, if I may ask you on this from the administration standpoint uh, and where you all stand, DOE, are you all concerned about our ability to get back into production or be able to do it in a sufficient way that the public will support it, but also know the needs that we have for defense of our country? Uh, I think we can definitely do it. And um, we're grateful for Congress's support on creating a, uh, a uranium strategy mm -hmm. inside the United States by repurposing some of the civil nuclear credit to get $2.7 billion to create our own fuel cycle here. Um, however, as I was mentioning to Senator uh, Wicker earlier, the only way that we can access that funds is if Congress passes a ban on the import of Russian uranium, and we're hopeful tried, that... We're trying very hard. Very good. That's great. I will say one other thing on the civil side. Um, the high assay, low enriched uranium, of course, is necessary for the small modular reactors and the advanced reactors, and that's a very important part of our cycle and our strategy to be able to have more nuclear power in addition to My what My final happening. question would be along those lines. With the onslaught, basically, and we have the development of SMRs and micros uh, to be coming into the workforce, if you will, into the production of the uh, uh, private sector. Is, is that taken into consideration by 2040, we're running in a depletion or basically in a need, or will it be accelerated like 2030 maybe or twenty. We need to accelerate. We need, there's no doubt. There's that a concern, the but I mean, is that these, the number we're using 2040, does that take in consideration what we're talking about here? Um, I think that's mostly on the defense side. It is. Yeah, and on the civilian side, I mean, these reactors are being developed right now. The very, advanced, very quickly, rapidly. And they are, in, they will, they have access to Russian HALU, and we need that capability here. Yeah which is why we have to act with urgency. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Uh, thank you, Senator Manchin. Senator Ernst, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for being here today to testify in front of the committee. And uh, Secretary Granholm, we'll start with you. Um, Secretary Granholm, should taxpayer dollars be granted to U.S. sanctioned countries or institutions? Yes or no? You mean through the by, through, through DOE? DOE? No. Okay, thank you. Um, because as you know, the Department of Energy distributes billions of dollars in grants and awards. And in February, a magazine published a research article acknowledging support from a taxpayer-funded DOE award. The same article credits an Iranian researcher employed by Iran's state-linked Sharif University of Technology. U.S. authorities have sanctioned multiple Sharif University entities due to their ties to Iran's nuclear program. Britain and EU have also sanctioned the university due to similar concerns. So Secretary Granholm, did taxpayer dollars in this grant support the Iranian researcher? I'm not familiar with this grant, but perhaps you can share the article and I can follow up. We will definitely do that. Um, and, and thank you for that response. Um, we will share that because this is of great concern to us. Um, the reports are cause for concern um, no matter how those grants are distributed uh, because Iran builds up their nuclear, as they're building up their nuclear arsenal, we must be absolutely certain that taxpayer dollars are not funding a researcher working for a university linked to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we just witnessed, of course, Iran attack our ally, Israel, and their proxies have taken American service members' lives. Um, at Tower 22, um, here within the last several months, we lost three American service members, uh, members of the 718th Engineer Company of, of uh, Georgia. They were U.S. Army Reserves. They were, their lives were lost at the hands of Iranian proxies. Um, so the capabilities cannot even remotely be strengthened uh, by American taxpayer dollars. And so those answers will matter. So Secretary Granholm will provide you with that information and we'll expect a response back. Thank you, Thank you Secretary. And uh, kind of on that same theme then, um, do you know what safeguards the department has in place to ensure that our Department of Energy funded American researchers do not share sensitive information about technology with academics working for a sanctioned university uh, located from adversaries. We have a very robust uh, counterintelligence uh, strategy inside of the department, which is um, looking both at lab research partnerships, et cetera, to ensure that we are securing American IP, that we are not uh, endangering, obviously, uh, by releasing certainly any sensitive uh, information from, our, from the defense side of our operation. We've also set up a whole strategy inside the department for vetting requests coming in from those who, from companies who might want to access DOE grants or loans. It's a research uh, technology and um, uh, economic security effort that's similar to CFIUS uh, mm -hmm. inside the department. We have beefed up our efforts on that to ensure that we are being extra cautious on both uh, making sure that we are not uh, Take, that we are not partnering with entities that um, will create a problem for the United States, but also that we are viewing those who, with, with whom we are working to ensure that uh, sensitive information is not going in the wrong direction. Thank you, I appreciate that. We have seen other departments that have, through contracts and subcontracts, sent dollars overseas uh, to other entities. It, all we have to do is look at uh, the COVID-19 issue that we had and how American taxpayer dollars were funneled to China uh, for research. Um, so uh, as you are talking through this, um, is it your your view then that uh, taxpayer dollars are not going to those areas um, that might be uh, benefiting our adversaries? Well, it, you know, you have to sort of carve this with a scalpel and not with an axe when you're talking about the civilian side because supply chains in the manufacturing base have been so intertwined, for example, with China 
that it uh, that to say that a supply chain in an EV company that has a component that may have been uh, uh, reshored from China that may have actually started with the United States, but we get it back, but there may be some kind of connection. What we want to do is to mitigate the the potential damage to the U.S. We do want to reshore, obviously, um, IP and companies that were sucked mm -hmm. overseas with intentional um, industrial strategy by other countries to be able to get that. So we try to really balance what is going to be in the interests of America and security uh, to ensure that both taxpayer dollars are spent for that in a way that will serve American interests. That's very important. Thank you, Secretary, and, and thank you so much for the time. Um, Mr. Chair, I do think it's important that we acknowledge that we need to bring that supply chain back to the United States of America, but especially sensitive research, we need to ensure that no taxpayer dollars are going to entities that we would consider adversaries. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Uh, Senator Rosen, please. Uh, well, thank you, Chairman Reed. I really appreciate the hearing. I want to thank Secretary Granholm and Administrator Ruby, of course, for your service, for your hard work, and your uh, and your knowledge. And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nevada because Nevada has, of course, played a critical role in uh, nuclear weapons development, but often at a very high cost. From 1951 to 1992, 928 nuclear weapons were actually detonated in Nevada. It's causing people and land to be exposed to toxic levels of radiation. And it's why I firmly oppose any policies that would put Nevadans at risk again, from returning to the days of explosive testing, nuclear testing, uh, to the shipping of nuclear waste to be stored at Yucca Mountain, and a dangerous, at Yucca Mountain, it's a dangerous and misguided proposal that some of our colleagues in the House, well, they just raised it again last week. That's one of the reasons why, of course, I strongly support the mission of the Nevada National Security Site, which verifies the reliability and the effectiveness of our nuclear stockpile through advanced scientific experiments and modeling so that nuclear weapons will never have to be tested again. So to, to both of you, um, as you know, mining and construction continue at the Principal Underground Laboratory for Subcritical Experimentation, or PULSE, formerly known as the uh, U1A Complex. And this expansion is going to allow the lab to house two machines that will uh, uh, improve our ability to it assess performance, safety, and reliability of our nuclear stockpile. So, uh, Secretary, can you provide us an update and then uh, Administrator on the project and speak to some of the other key projects uh, currently underway at the site, please? Great, thanks. I think I'm going to defer the question to okay. um, the Perfect. Administrator since she's got her finger on the pulse of all All righty, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Rosen. Uh, we enjoy a great relationship with you and the, the state of Nevada, and we're, um, we're grateful <coughs> for the work that's being uh, done there. Uh, let's see, you referred to the Pulse facility, formerly known as the UNA, and the things we're doing there, which is ex are extremely important to our stockpile. So these concern subcritical testing that are consistent with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, but retain our knowledge of, of, um, of, of how to work underground uh, and how to work at NNSS. Uh, these experiments uh, are will allow us to look at aging of plutonium materials and, and plutonium pits, um, both, both aged ones and then new ones to verify that they perform as we would expect them to perform from our previous tests so that we will never have to test again. That's our goal. Um, other important things we're doing at NNSS uh, are these, uh, are, are these um, tests, the chemical explosive tests that simulate very low yield nuclear explosive tests that might be done by others there. We want to detect the seismic signature so we can be sure that all countries around the world um, and, uh, are, are, uh, that say they're uh, a comprehensive test ban treaty uh, comply, compliant are in fact uh, complying with the test ban treaty. And so we're doing some uh, very important work 
uh, at Nevada, and, uh, and that, that's become a very key facility for us. Thank you. Well, we're very proud of what we do, and we're proud of the remote sensing lab that uh, helps with that as well. But, of course, we need the workforce to work out there. So there's been a steady rise in the workforce requirements uh, in the Department of Energy and more specifically at the NNSA. And the recurring challenge is always being uh, the development of that skilled workforce, particularly in critical fields like ma physics, mathematics, computer programming, and chemistry. So I'm excited about the proposed, uh, the proposed Nevada National Security Site Fast Start Program and its potential for recruiting, educating, and training these entry-level technicians to begin careers in nuclear security related jobs right at home in Nevada. So the Fast Start program is going to support the NNSS, which has identified, of course, you know this, the growing need to have skilled um, technicians, really skilled employees from diverse backgrounds to work on our national security programs, even in construction, maintenance, business operations, as well as the science and technology. So Administrator, given these dynamics, um, how is the Department of Energy, and of course, Secretary, you can answer too, and the NSA actively engaging with our academic institutions uh, to grow the future workforce, and can you talk about um, Fast Start program and uh, how our local students might begin careers uh, working at the Nevada National Security Site, or we still call it the test site, Nevada. <laughs> yeah, we try to call experiments now. That's a, it's important distinction. So, I, uh, but here's uh, here's what we do. We 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 work. Um, intensely on our pipeline. We have uh, university programs that are for recruiting. We have university programs that are for research. Both are great pipeline programs for us. And we've extended those to programs for technologists and for craft workers and others that we need desperately in our complex as well to be very highly skilled workers. Uh, and what we do is we identify um, skills that are needed across the complex, and we have national programs for that, and we, have, uh, we identify skills that are needed locally, and we have local programs for that that we support. And, uh, and the, the program, the FAST program in Nevada is one where it is aimed to support the needs of that site locally where people tend to, we, we tend to recruit people from the region, we like to keep them in the region, mm -hmm. and that program is aimed to do just that. So thank you for your nice words about it. Thank you. Can, can I just jump yes, on that? Yes. Because of course, once we recruit, uh, once we recruit and train, we don't want to lose them. Right. And so we uh, we were just discussing a little bit earlier, and I just want to foot stomp the need for um, NNSA and the whole scientific enterprise of the United States, which so much of which is embedded in the de Department of Energy, to have the ability to compete with the private sector mm -hmm. um, by ensuring that we've got decent work conditions, not overloaded uh, folks, the ability to pay uh, what they are worth, uh, et cetera. So the support that this uh, committee can offer to our appropriations request <laughs> to hire additional people so that we don't have burnout and attrition yeah. uh, before retirement okay, would be greatly yeah. appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Scott, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here. Secretary Granholm. Um, the Biden administration announced uh, that they were going to um, pause pending LNG export projects, which seems like the stupidest decision I can imagine. So in my state, we export LNG. Um, we have through our ports. We put a lot of money when I was governor into our ports. We export it. And so if you look around the world, they want our LNG. We've got a war going on in Europe. We don't want people dependent on Russia. Uh, so we're exporting to Europe, we're exporting to Asia, right? The people, the bad, the bad guys are the ones that produce the oil, a lot of them, Russia, Iran, right? So if we don't do the exports, right, so where do our allies buy it? They have to buy more from Russia, they have to buy more from Iran, okay? So Iran's invaded Ukraine, Iran is trying to destroy Israel. So this makes, it, one, economically, it hurts my state, but number two, from, a, from the standpoint of what's going on in the world, this is the stupidest decision ever. So can you explain it to me? Yeah, just to uh, clarify a point, this is a pause. It is not a halt. Why would we all, pause? So Stop. that we can this. evaluate, uh, as we do and are required to do, what is in the public interest. We do a study 
every few years, right now is when we're doing this study, to determine whether the enormous increase Did Russia pause in authorizations. Ukraine? Did Russia pause going into Ukraine? Determine Has Iran paused? All of the um, current exports are still happening. All of the current authorizations, which goes up to 48 billion cubic feet, are all proceeding. Did you pause the new pending export pending, projects? But yes. everything that is, we are currently the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, and we will remain Did the you largest pause exporter yes. of, of liquefied natural gas. First off, it is a temporary pause. Do you, do you so understand do what you're doing to our allies? The impacts. Secretary, We've wait, talked with our down. allies. What are you doing to our allies? Okay. We've talked with our allies about this. They are they have very well understand that this is a temporary pause while we do an analysis of what the impacts what would, are what would you, in the what United would the analysis States. Be? What, I mean, what do you have to now? I'm I mean, happy to tell you. To stop and think about it. Just a second. Me, we the world is at war. They need our energy. And they will continue and you're to get them, it, sir. You're telling them, no, we're gonna slow it down. No. That's not what we're telling them. That's what a pause means. No, a pause means on future future approvals. We have so much approved that we are well saturating the globe if those authorizations are built out. We have 14 billion cubic feet of capacity right now. That makes us the largest in the world what, what, right what now. What would you have to Another study? Another 12 billion cubic what, feet that are under construction. What do you have to study? None of that is stopping. Wait, wait, it is what only do you have to a study? pause for a study okay, what that you have will to be study? completed in months. Okay, what do you have to study? Okay. What's, what's there to study? There we, want things, to do, we want to sell LNG. There are four L things LNG. we're studying. To be Pardon? able to answer your question, there are four things we're studying. One is, what is the impact domestically on our manufacturers if we export almost half of our capacity for producing natural gas? What is the what's the impact in terms of cost, number one? Number two, what is the impact, the life cycle analysis, on the export of LNG. Number three, what is the impact on our allies overseas? What is the demand we're gonna be seeing to make sure that they are well supplied and that they have the energy that they need? Um, and- Do you have any manufacturer call you and say, gosh, I'm worried because we're selling LNG overseas? Um, there is a, There are a lot of domestic uh, concerns. In fact, we've gotten letters on both sides of the aisle here about what does it mean for costs at home if you export almost half of what you currently produce. What is the impact from a supply and demand point? It's a question. And that's, we're you only doing- You think we doing, should export nothing? We're gonna, I mean, no, do you, should, I'm, should we do that I'm with all of, is, everything we export? As we, as we uh, authorize massive amounts of exports, we need to know what is the impact on America, on do our American with manufacturers, that analysis, on our homeowners, what is the cost? Secretary, with that analysis, do you think we ought to put pauses on exporting Anything else we manufacture in this country? The reason why we're doing this is because there's been such an extraordinary increase in authorizations. When we did our last study, we were only exporting 4 billion cubic feet. Now we have authorized 48 billion. Not all of that will be built, but the point is we need to go eyes open to see what is the impact on us at home as well as on our allies and to have our labs do a, a modeling to make sure that we follow the science and understand what the impacts are before we start to approve a whole bunch more. So if you were head of commerce, then you would start ex you'd start pausing exports of manufacturing goods because you think, man, that's gonna cause the cost of manufacturing goods for Americans to go up. That makes, it makes zero sense and it's having dramatic impact on my state. So I think you made a, a horrible decision and I hope you'll change. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Granholm, good to uh, see you uh, again. Uh, Administrator you, uh, Ruby, uh, welcome uh, to the, the committee. Uh, my first question is, uh, is to both of you. Uh, as you uh, both are well aware, the availability of low-cost drones has uh, dramatically increased the risk of weaponizing uh, unmanned aerial systems being used uh, against uh, our uh, critical uh, infrastructure. This threat uh, is unfortunately particularly acute at our national laboratories, uh, plants and installations responsible for both maintaining as well as sustaining our nuclear stockpile. So my question uh, for, for both of you, I understand you have been working uh, to mitigate uh, threats uh, by drones and UAS uh, to our nuclear infrastructure. And as these risks uh, continue to evolve, what uh, enhanced uh, authorities do you need to protect uh, that uh, critical infrastructure? Mr. Ruby, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, 
We, uh, we do already deploy uh, UAS detection and counter UAS systems, but they're not good enough for the future threats that we're already beginning to see. So we're upgrading those. And we're upgrading also, so we wanna upgrade our systems, especially the, to help us counter threats uh, that are evolving. In addition, we're looking at our policies and we're creating a new test range. So the test range will be in Idaho, uh, where we can make sure that we fully understand the systems to counter UASs and we can train people to do that. And then we're updating our policies that will be, cons yeah, will <clears throat> we'll get a look across the interagency in the U.S., and there are a lot of people who have impact on policy, but that we will change, we are trying to change our policy so that our protective forces, as they detect UASs that cross a line to the things that we are really trying to guard, our crown jewels, if you will, that they can counter those systems without additional approvals. Great. Secretary Granholm? Very good. Uh, since uh, the, the beginning of uh, the unprovoked uh, invasion by Russia, uh, Russia has uh, targeted Ukrainians' uh, inter energy infrastructure, including its uh, nuclear uh, power plants. Uh, and in the process, they've deprived millions of Ukrainians uh, of heat uh, as well as electricity. Uh, in response, uh, DOE and, and NSA have assisted our Ukrainian partners in stabilizing uh, their energy markets and safeguarding their nuclear infrastructure. So my question uh, for the both of you is, how has DOE and, and NNSA support allowed the Ukrainians to continue uh, their resistance against Russia? And do your organizations have the resources that you need to continue these efforts, specifically in support of Ukraine's nuclear power plants? Thank you for this question and for recognizing that we are um, partners with Ukraine in trying to preserve and rebuild uh, their, their energy infrastructure. Um, and in a say, and, and I'm sure um, Dr. Ruby can say a word about this, has been uh, an incredible partner in providing, for example, um, radiation uh, detection technology uh, training on that. Um, the Department of Energy has also identified where the gaps are in their electricity system, for example, uh, transformers, et cetera. What do you need? And we have delivered um, scores, uh, hundreds of components that we have actually um, gotten donated from either around the United States or our allies so that their grid can be rebuilt. Um, we are also focused on uh, war-proofing the existing grid and the future grid as well. So what are the ways to harden the existing grid? We have work, worked with them on connecting their grid to the EU. So NSOE is now connected to the EU and not reliant upon Russia. But clearly we also have to um, pursue um, President Zelensky's goal of being much, having a much more distributed and clean energy system, which is less vulnerable to attacks. And so planning for that future is part of what we are engaged in now. Uh, hopefully, you know, this conflict gets resolved uh, in Ukraine's favor soon, but we want to be partners with them in building the grid of the future there as well. Great, thank you. Hey, just let me say a few words about the nuclear side. So. We have uh, installed, since the start of this conflict, many radiological and nuclear detectors uh, in Ukraine and the surrounding areas to make sure that we can detect as soon as possible independently uh, any radiological or nuclear release from an incident at a nuclear power plant or any other kind of incident. Uh, and, and we've spent a lot of time training our Ukrainian colleagues so that the, in the event of an incident, they would have a, a, a proper um, and effective response, a public health response to that incident. Right. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Tuberville, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks both for being here in Alabama. We uh, were fifth largest producer of nuclear with uh, two nuclear plants and five nuclear reactors. Uh, I know a lot of people in the and uh, our neck of the woods are, are very concerned about our power grid in the future. Um, just a uh, quick question about uh, building new nuclear plants, uh, the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. You know, if, if we're looking to build a nuclear, uh, nuclear plant, uh, just the review is lasting four to seven years. Uh, 
which should probably take about one to two years. And if we're going to combat China, if we're going to build a new power grid, Senate, uh, Secretary, uh, do you see the average timeline to complete these environmental studies as normal? Uh, and how, how can we go around this? Well, I'm not sure about normal, but yeah. I do agree with you. You're the, at least what I assume you're getting at, which is that we need to speed up times for permitting. Uh, both nuclear as well as transmission, as well as other energy generation, including clean energy. How do we get bogged down in this? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me because we're getting, we're getting overrun, uh, well, you know, by other countries. I, I, I know our office would be eager to work with you or anyone on the committee, and I know a number of people have been working on permitting reform to accelerate um, because we believe that that is important for the reliability of our grid. Thank you. Yeah, over 40% of our U.S. Navy's combat-capable warships are nuclear-powered. Uh, the Office of Naval Reactors has a cradle-to-grave responsibility for designing, maintaining, and disposing the spent fuel from vital nuclear reactors. But uh, much of these facilities and infrastructures uh, the Navy is using is aging. I know for a fact we're spending tens of millions of dollars with uh, ships that are dry docked that we're having to pay. Uh, just have them dry docked instead of taking the, the fuel off, uh, having it uh, replenished or uh, disposed of. Uh, so we're having delays uh, in this spent fuel handling re recapitalization project, and uh, it's affecting all of our nuclear plants, and is my understanding from the Navy. Uh, what, did you, what do you see as a problem, and how do we fix that, uh, Secretary? Either one of you, if you want to answer that. Yes, yeah, Senator, thank you for that question. We are uh, building a new spent fuel handling capability uh, in, in, in Idaho, uh, and it, it is sized so that it can handle all nuclear reactors on all of our Navy ships, which today's, uh, today's facilities can, and it's very old. Uh, and we, uh, we had a lot of, uh, honestly, we had a lot of trouble post-COVID with this construction project, just like we did with many of our other construction projects, but it's really turned around. I was there not too long ago, uh, all the concrete's in, all, rebar's going up, it's, it's really coming along, and I think we're on a path now that will get this facility built and operational uh, just as we, uh, we intend, you know, we intend to. We're, uh, we're working this problem hard, and, and our naval reactors folks are, I think, have done a really good job of taking um, a project behind schedule and trying to catch up as much time as possible. A am I correct that it's costing us millions of dollars just to dry dock these, to store? Uh, Senator, I don't know the cost of the dry docking, but I can um, talk to my colleagues. And I'd love to get some reactors. kind of report on that because my understanding is costing tens of millions just to have them parked and not anything done to them. Uh, and we don't have the capabilities of, of dispensing or, or doing whatever we do with, with uh, this fuel on whether it's a, a flat top, whether it's a submarine. Uh, and we, we need to figure this out it's cost, if it's costing us that much money. Right. I, I, uh, I understood. Yeah. We'll get back with you on the cost, but you can, uh, you have my word that we're working as hard as possible to get this new facility up and operating so that- We, we only can... have one that we're working on? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I know we have a, uh, a, a shipyard in Mobile that uh, is looking to do the enterprise. Uh, in the very near future, hopefully that happens, but you can imagine how old the enterprise is, how long it's been setting, dry docking, and the money that it's cost the country and the taxpayers uh, for, you know, to be just sitting there, nothing done with it. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tocqueville. Senator Rounds, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to both of you today, uh, Secretary Granholm, uh, Administrator Ruby. It actually feels more comfortable to say Governor Granholm, but uh, those were the, the, the good old days. Uh, but thanks for both for being here. Uh, Secretary Granholm, be before we move on to the matters pertaining to nuclear deterrence, I'd like to briefly discuss the Sanford Underground Research Facility in Leeds, South Dakota, uh, its relationship with Fermi Laboratory. This facility has been an important partner for the Department of Energy in conducting critical research in the fields of particle physics and dark matter. 
Um, sometimes I think people wonder what in the world we're doing in the Department of Energy and working on these particular areas of expertise, but this is a pretty important deal for our nation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the funding for this type of a facility in terms of our long-term strategies? Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. We're very proud of this too. It's the deepest lab in the United States and in the experiment with um, Fermi. 4,850 feet underground. Amazing. No. Um, and of course, trying to understand the, um, the, the secrets of the universe, the secrets of, of matter, uh, the secrets of neutrinos in this, in this case uh, is super important to basic fundamental science. And the thing we say about uh, basic research is that you may not know where it leads, but when you look back, you realize that so much, whether it's in material science or um, you know, uh, medicine, et cetera, has, stems from the research that's being done in these massive user facilities like uh, at SURF. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, uh, and you probably know this, but that in July of this year, the, the uh, excavation subproject is going to be completed. Um, the outfitted uh, portion will be done by September of 2026. Uh, the cosmic rays in the first uh, site detector at SURF will be in 2029, and first neutrinos in 2031. So we're going to continue to support this. Hopefully, Congress will continue to support it with your leadership I as well. I totally agree, and I, I just think uh, uh, the message that we need to be sending is, is neutrinos are very important. Neutrinos are very important. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Administrator Ruby, can you update us on the current issue, uh, and this may be getting into the weeds a little bit, but I think it's important to bring it to our attention, the current issue with the availability of high explosive binders and how this could affect our current modernization plan. Specifically, it's it's, it, it's a chemical that binds these high explosives together, and apparently it is, a, it is associated that those that are available to us have a PFAS component to them. And since we're trying to eliminate PFAS, we really have a problem when it comes to this type of a product which needs that particular uh, a component in it. Can you talk a little bit about that and what our plans are? Yeah, thanks, Senator Rounds. Uh, let's see. It is true that we buy a PFAS binder uh, from the commercial sector, uh, and the, um, the, 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 this product is no longer going to be made by the primary manufacturer. Uh, and it does then mean that we need to develop another binder or another source for this binder, uh, and we're working hard on that. So we have a, several lines of effort. The first and most important, I think, is that we're going to recycle as much as we can the current binder that we have in the system to stay on schedule for our, our weapon delivery programs. Uh, we are looking uh, at also potentially well, we're going to buy as much binder as we can from the supplier before they stop making it. And, um, and the reason why they're stopping making it is because we've all identified that PFAS is really dangerous in the environment, but most of that's from firefighting not right. necessarily from a plastic component that we would be using in this type of a, of a binder, correct? That's right. This, this, uh, this is a complicated environmental issue. The particular PFAS material uh, involved in the binder that we care about has not been shown to have an adverse effect on human health. It, however, it does last a long time, yeah. and as a result, the uh, EPA is, you know, lumping these together into a system that they, they don't want in the, in the environment. So, uh, so we have to find an uh, alternative, uh, and we have to use all the things that we currently have to get through our current program, and we have a very uh, active group of people who are working this uh, intensely. Uh, so that we can stay on schedule, but obviously we can't have nuclear weapons without effective explosives. Or perhaps as an alternative, getting an exception for this type of a use for a PFAS that is not hurting the environment. Yeah, uh, that... I know uh, it gets into policy areas, but it, this it's a, a real problem policy for you. policy area, yeah. correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Round. Senator King, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nice to see both of you this morning. Uh, Administrator Ruby, uh, some questions. Uh, 
I'm, I'm worried about uh, pit production and the capacity to meet increasing demand for uh, weapon grade material, given the fact that we're refurbishing the entire triad plus AUKUS. Uh, tell me where we are in terms of, of uh, pit production uh, at, at, uh, at the two facilities. Yeah, thank you, Senator King. Uh, let's see, uh, just to uh, level set, we are, we're reestablishing pit production, which was stopped in the United States with the closure of Rocky Flats. Uh, we are doing that at two locations, Los Alamos National Laboratories and San, uh, the Savannah River site. Uh, Los Alamos uh, already had an existing facility to work with plutonium, but it's limited in size and it wasn't making pits. Uh, that's moving along nicely. We expect that our first uh, fully certified uh, war reserve pit will be produced at Los Alamos in, in this year. Uh, and then we're working towards a goal of 30 pits per year at Los Alamos. Those pits are, uh, will be in the W87-1 warhead, uh, which is, uh, on, is for the Sentinel. Uh, we expect to be get, get 30 pits per year by uh, 2028 so with you, more reliability pit, by 2030. Is the pit production schedule running in parallel with the, with the renewal of the triad? In other words, you don't see a gap in terms of having the capacity uh, uh, for Sentinel, for example, and not having the Yeah, the we warheads. have a plan that's fully consistent with uh, the schedule with the Department of Defense to put new pits uh, in, in our warheads. Now, uh, in some cases, the Savannah River is uh, scheduled, we're, we're, we're targeting completion of construction of the Savannah River Plutonium Processing Facility in 2032, and then uh, we have to introduce uh, we have to introduce plutonium. We have to introduce uh, the processes uh, and the rate production. That'll take a few more years, but our plan is to be able to produce uh, pits for the new W93 warhead, uh, and we're targeting at least half of that population. We don't not, we we don't think we can get that facility up in time to do all of the W93 builds. But it's important that we have a fair number of those uh, new pits because our option is to uh, reuse pits, which introduces some uncertainty. But more importantly, we just uh, it, it limits uh, it limits what else we can do in our stockpile. Uh, when we uh, so, reuse those pits. So, so you, do you feel we're, we're on a reasonable, predictable schedule at Savannah River? Are you confident that, we've, that the contractor and, and the plans are moving forward uh, adequately? I, I, I'm increasingly confident. We, you know, we have a lot of work in front of us, uh, but we, I, I feel much better uh, about where we are. I think we've turned the corner in terms of uh, what we're doing at Savannah River. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we have a good, good team in place uh, let, to, let me, to do this Let me work. change the subject for a moment. Uh, one of my nightmares is, is a terrorist organization getting a hold of a nuclear weapon. And we've got North Korea, Iran. North Korea would probably sell anything if they can get cash for it. Uh, talk to me about the technology of detection. We, we, the deterrence doesn't work with... Uh, 15 people who don't care about dying and don't have a capital city. In other words, the whole theory of deterrence doesn't work with terrorists. So the first line of defense has to be detection and uh, understanding what's going on. Do we, are we working in that direction? How do we know that there may be a nuclear device in a container that's on its way to Miami? Yeah. Well, a lot of the responsibility for detection is also with the Department of Homeland Security, but we develop technologies and we uh, place those technologies uh, around the world. And we have a lot of those in place. They're operating and we're increasing the countries that we're working with uh, because of their neighborhood uh, and because we want to make sure that the U.S. Uh, is their go-to partner um, for that. So we've increased the number of countries we're working with in terms of detection. Well, I just I, want to mention this, this should be a very, very high priority because there are people, yeah. if those people on September 11th could have killed 3 million people instead of 3,000, they would have. And so I, I just... I, I, as sure as we're sitting here, there are people 
that are adversaries that are thinking about how to how to acquire a nuclear weapon. I agree, Senator. It's a very high priority for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Cotton, please. Secretary Granholm, last September, President Biden said, quote, the only existential threat humanity faces, even things more frightening than a nuclear war, is global warming. Do you agree? I strongly believe that climate change is an existential threat uh, to the planet. Okay, so that's not exactly my question. President Biden said the only existential threat humanity faces, even things more frightening than a nuclear war, is global warming. Do you believe that nuclear war is an existential threat? Of course. Okay, so that's not what the president said. What is more frightening about global warming than nuclear war? Well, I'm not in a position to compare the two, but I can say that climate change is having a dastardly impact across the globe, particularly uh, in areas that are subject to uh, heat. We've had record heat years now, uh, consecutively, do, year after year, but, which has but devastating But, Mr. Secretary, impact. do you agree? Do, sounds like you, you don't agree with the president that global warming is more frightening than nuclear war. I am not in a position to characterize what the president was saying. I'm just saying that it is okay. an existential threat. So as the Secretary of Energy, your most important job is our nation's stockpile of nuclear weapons, which is the backbone of our entire national defense. Every military operation by the Department of Defense is underwritten by that strategic deterrent. But last year, you testified that ensuring we have enough lithium for electric vehicle batter batteries is more urgent than ensuring the nation's stockpile for nuclear that nuclear weapons are adequate. Do, do you still believe that our lithium supply, as important as that is, and I grant you, is more important than the nation's nuclear weapon stockpile? I don't recall saying that. Okay. Well, do you, do you believe that? I believe that the lithium supply is important, but the nation's nuclear stockpile is very important as well. Is it the most important thing you do in your job? I don't rank things in my job. Not at all? So making sure that the annual picnic comes off well is <laughs> as important as the nation's <laughs> nuclear stockpile? That I would rank lower, yes. All right. Um, Ms. Ruby, um, can you discuss what you're doing to recruit agents to the Office of Secure Transportation. Um, do you have enough agents to accomplish your current nuclear weapons transportation requirements? Yeah, thank you for this question, Senator. Uh, we are, uh, this is a very important function that we have that uh, a lot of people don't understand, that we do transport uh, nuclear weapons that are still in the custody of the Department of Energy or when they're coming back to the custody of the Department of Energy. And, and these agents are amazing. Uh, they have a hard job and they do it very well and they do it, uh, they've done it safely and securely for a long period of time. And of course we have a, a, a great training facility at, at Fort Chaffee. Uh, we are always trying to recruit people. We, uh, this is, uh, we have enough. We do our job, uh, but uh, but we have to work hard to recruit and and and, and as importantly train uh, the agents as we get them. So it's a constant concern for us. Uh, but um, a, a, but we pre we're paying so attention to it. Thank th you. These are these are high, highly specialized roles and equipment, right? You can't just Absolutely. throw a nuclear warhead in the back of your F-150 and drive it between military bases. Not in the United States of America. Uh, so the, the, we have very specialized uh, uh, trucks, vehicles, convoys that transport materials that these agents are responsible for. They go through rigorous testing, uh, both physically and mentally, to be capable of doing these jobs. They're a huge, hugely important part of our workforce. Okay. Um I believe you have 370 positions authorized. You know how many you currently have filled? I don't off the top of my head. My understanding is only about, it's only about 280. And, and with the, the upcoming modernization plans, I, I have concerns about the office's ability to fulfill its mission and the strain it's going to put on those agents. So, so I, I'd encourage uh, you and the 
and the department to look at what you can do to recruit more folks into that office. I, I see that the clock has disappeared, so I guess I have an indefinite amount of time to ask as many questions as I want, but I'll yield back to the chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Cotton. Uh, and let me recognize for five minutes, uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here today and for your very extensive public service. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Secretary Granholm, the standards for PFAS that you have adopted at the Department of Energy and that you now uh, implement, are they different from the standards that the EPA just announced as applicable to municipalities and the major initiative that President Biden has started to rid our nation's water serving citizens around the nation of this really dreaded threat? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that. Obviously, we don't want to see different standards uh, being applied across departments uh, differently, and I'm sure there will be an effort to realign if, if it is, in fact, different. Yeah, I think it's important that the standards be uniform uh, because, uh, and I frankly don't know the answer to that question myself. Well, EPA sets this, so we would follow their lead. Great. Uh, Mr. Uh, Administrator Harubi, uh, I'm concerned about, uh, I know you've been asked about, I think by Senator Kane about AUKUS and uh, the nuclear reactor program there. Uh, but I'm concerned about whether from your perspective the uh, naval reactors are on track to support the AUKUS commitments that we have made to production delivery of the Virginia class boats over the next 10 to 15 years relating to Australia. Do you think that program is on track? Yeah, the Naval Reactors Organization has worked very hard to um, evaluate the options that we provided to the Australians to support, and I'm confident with the, the, the proposed plan that our Naval Reactors Organization can support that. That is separate. Naval reactors are separate from shipbuilding, so I, I really just speaking to will we be able to provide the naval reactors needed for the AUKUS deal, and, and I'm confident that we can. Um, I, I want to ask uh, you and maybe Secretary Granholm on the issue of security for the reactor facilities in Ukraine and the danger that is posed by the Russian aggression there. Have, have you, uh, do you know whether there is money in the supplemental that is specifically allocated to nuclear safety in Ukraine? Yeah, our request in the supplemental for NNSA, Department of Energy is $149 million uh, and uh, we, we very much hope that we get that um, I apologize support. if you've already answered this question, but in terms of that supplemental request, do you view it as important to the safety of those reactors and of the region from possible destruction? Uh, I, I, I do. Uh, I, I think it's important for the consequences and for the safety. So we, we watch for radiological release, so it's important to recognize it immediately. We've trained with the Ukrainians and we meet with them on a regular basis to make sure that they would know how to respond in the event of a radiological release. We uh, ha have ways to help protect uh, if the Ukrainians adopt them, um, the important electrical nodes, grid nodes around the reactors. But we can't prevent, we have no role in preventing a drone strike or an attack on the plant. So I just, but what we are, we are trying to lower the consequence in the event that anything would happen or the, uh, and hopefully that it would happen, that it wouldn't happen. In, in my trips to Ukraine, I've been there five times over the last couple of years. I've talked to President Zelensky and his energy and his military team about this issue, and you're absolutely right. You can't guarantee the air defense. That's a military function, and obviously self-defense from 
missile and drone attacks is part of this supplemental. So I think it's important to energy security as well as other forms of security in the country. Uh, I notice the clock is back on, Mr. Chairman, and my time has expired, so I'm going to yield. Thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Granholm, when was the last time you spoke to a representative from the Chinese Communist Party? I spoke with um, a member of the Chinese delegation at the APEC conference last summer. Okay. Um, a report released in August of 2023 mentions that you would consult with your counterpart at the Chinese Communist Party about potential strategic petroleum reserve sales. Is that true? Oh, uh, yes, I did. Okay. Um, was your, what was the nature of that conversation? They, I tried to, but we couldn't connect. But I was intending to speak with him. Okay. Um, have you had conversations outside of what I, the, the instance I just mentioned? When we go to an APEC summit, which is the Asian Pacific uh, conference where we uh, talk with countries, and of course China is a member, uh, we often uh, meet with our counterparts. And last, I think last summer, there, the APEC conference, I can't remember the exact date, uh, I know that I had a conversation with uh, my counterpart from China on, uh, on energy. Was um, your decision-making process uh, on decisions related to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, influenced by the conversations you had with the Chinese Communist That's Party? at a different time. Um, yeah, I want to get back to 2021. Okay, so the um, International uh, Energy Agency had a global stockpile release uh, in response to the war in Ukraine. And we were all encouraging other countries to release from their stockpiles so that we could um, replace the barrels that were pulled off the market as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, two things have happened since then. We've not replenished our strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, and China has an enormous stockpile now. Um, they have their own strategic petroleum reserve. Do they call you? to talk to you about decisions related to their strategic petroleum reserve? Again, this was just a decision to get a number of countries to release so why, that it, but would, I'm, release, I'm just it curious. would relieve global why pressure. Would you, why would you be reaching out to a representative from the Chinese Communist Party about our decision to release oil from the it strategic It was not about our decision. It was asking them to release as we were asking other countries to release as well. Okay. It was our decision to release. We still are governed by, you know, we're not, a, we're not a governed by a world government yet. Like we make that, the Biden administration made that decision. So was your call to inform them of our decision, to persuade them to release their own strategic? It was not about our decision. It was about their decision, asking them to release along with all of these other countries from their strategic stockpiles. And in fact, uh, a very large release did happen. And they bought, they bought a lot of that oil, didn't they? Uh, I have no idea what they You don't did. know if, the, if, if China bought a lot of our oil from that Strategic Petroleum Reserve release in 2021? Uh, I don't You're the energy secretary. Our, our release. The, obviously, releases happen on a global market. No, I'm talking about our release. They bought from our release. Um, it's my understanding that China has purchased a tiny amount, like under 3%, from our Strategic Petroleum Reserve that was before the ban. They are no longer purchasing. Okay. Again, this is all pursuant to what Congress requires us to do as an agency. Is there to was do no what? Restriction. There was no directive from Congress for you to release that oil. No, I'm talking about who we sell to. Right, but you don't need to talk to a representative from the Chinese Communist Party about our decision to release oil. Perhaps I'm not making myself clear. I did not talk to a member of the Chinese you tried, Communist though. Party you tried. about you told our decision you, about our okay. decision to release. It was okay. about encouraging them to release along with all of these other countries, so that we did they make do that? The Russian did they do that? that were pulled off the market. Did they do that? Um, they re they said that they did. I don't have evidence that they did. Yeah, because they have an enormous stockpile now, and ours is at historically low levels. And I want to point out that around nine hundred thousand barrels of oil were sold to Unipec America's subsidiary 
of the Chinese government-owned gas company, Sinopec, which in turn had received billions of dollars from BHR Partners. Who is BHR Partners? BHR Partners is a private equity firm co-founded by Hunter Biden, who held a 10% stake. Were you aware that Hunter Biden's Hunter Biden benefited from the sale of our strategic petroleum reserve by an affiliated Chinese company? No. Okay. Um, you've not replenished the strategic petroleum reserve since, right? We are in the process of doing that. Part of that is to repurchase barrels. Part of that at, at taxpayer, uh, at a, uh, an embrace. It's too expensive now, to wasn't taxpayer. that your statement? At the moment, it is above what we wanted to. We sold barrels at $95 a barrel. Uh, right now, the price for purchase is around uh, 90 or maybe a little bit left, less if you look at WTI. As the Secretary of Energy for the United States of America, do you regret depleting our strategic, tr st strategic petroleum reserves to historically low levels, I'd which like, they currently stand at? I'd like to um, just set the, st the stage. I'd like for you to answer the question because I'm out of time. Do you I regret am, that decision? I am going to set. No, I don't regret uh, doing what is right to be able to help replenish the global supplies. What about for the United States of America? I'm talking about for our country. Senator, you're out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can Senator she answer Jewell, the question? Senator Jill Warren, please. Secretary Granholm, um, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, despite the FBA's takedown of a Volt Typhoon botnet light last year, CISA Director Jen Easterly said there have been no big changes to the group's activity. As the sector risk management agency for the energy sector, how is the Department of Energy working to help critical infrastructure providers, providers identify and mitigate threats on their networks? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's such an important one as we um, perceive cyber threats to be um, really increasing. And the Volt uh, Typhoon example is one that where we're particularly concerned because um, Chinese cyber actors are pre-positioning themselves on the networks uh, in order to uh, be ready to strike in case of a conflict. So we have uh, ETEC, which we have set up uh, and, uh, um, uh, to be able to work with our partners uh, in the private sector, in uh, the utility space, to be on high alert for these kind of cyber activities. We've set out, uh, we've, uh, we've convened, we sent out learnings, we um, are in very close contact to make sure that we are providing the best information we have about where uh, one might find uh, some of this pre these pre-positioned um, efforts. Um, so we, are, we have set up a whole new infrastructure associated with cyber through our CSER office. Uh, and um, we are really pleased with the coordination that we are seeing as a public-private partnership manner with the private sector and with utilities. Do you believe you need more authorities uh, or resources to do this outreach successfully? Well, we could certainly always use more resources to be able to do that, but we believe that um, Congress has sufficiently at this moment supplied us with what we need through our CSER uh, budget and our partnership with CISA as well. Do you believe that um, there should be uh, a mandatory participation for the private sector with regard to critical infrastructure? Because from your answer and from previous hearings, my understanding is CISA can only provide best practices and encouragement and guidance, but certainly can't mandate anything. And I imagine you're under the same uh, lack of authority. Are you concerned at all that you can't guarantee safety, security, or even best effort by any uh, provider in the energy sector, and that would leave us vulnerable to a cyber attack because there's no way for you to make sure that they have the best defenses or have invested the right amount of cyber security in our critical infrastructure. Yeah, we, we um, have a very good relationship with all of the major utilities, but there are a lot of um, smaller utilities, munis, et cetera, and we have relationship with their associations. And we send out, we disseminate information and hope that that gets um, you know, pressed down through the so system. So the word you just used is you hope that right. they get pressed right. down. I mean, that is a very 
Yeah. That is, that is a very uh, inadequate frame, and I'm very concerned about it. And so I'm concerned that you don't have the authorities that you need and that you don't have the resources you need to properly safeguard the electric grid in the event of a cyber attack by China or other adversaries. Uh, well, mandating would certainly strengthen that. Correct. Um, <clears throat> can you tell us uh, in this setting uh, about the cyber attack on the electric grid in Guam? And can you tell us uh, about what you would have done differently or what authorities, if you had, could have been implemented? Because this is the Armed Services Committee. We want to make sure our warfighters have the capacity to defend this nation in the event of attack and to project our power. Mm -hmm. And without an electric grid at a base of operations that's owned by the private sector, uh, we can't do our job. Mm -hmm. So I'd like any thoughts or comments you have on that. Yeah. And I would uh, respectfully request that I get back to you on that so that I can have a fulsome response for you. That would be helpful. Um, last, do you have any recommendations about what kind of authorities, or can you, for the record, create some recommendations about what kind of authorities would be useful for you if you were given the task of making sure our electric grid does not go down in a cyber attack by China or any other adversary? And here, too, I would love to get back to you on, this, on some specifics authority-wise that I could consult with Caesar to see how we might additionally strengthen um, and the resources that it might take to do that. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Senator Gilburn. Uh, Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary Granholm and Director Ruby, thank you for being here today. Uh, Director Ruby, I'd like to ask you two related questions regarding the development of uh, new nuclear warheads. I think this is something that's already been addressed um, in the committee today. But um, so the uh, National Nuclear Security Administration is developing the W80-4 warhead for the uh, long range standoff uh, munition, LRSO. You've also been tasked to develop the uh, variant, the uh, W80-4 alternate uh, for the submarine launched cruise missile. And I understand the administration has been reluctant to start the development of a nuclear armed cruise missile for Navy submarines. I was on board the USS Indiana under the ice um, just about uh, six weeks ago or so. And uh, we discussed some of the challenges. Um, both from an engineering and an operational standpoint uh, for them. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy has been rather vocal in his opposition to this. However, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment has issued an acquis acquisition decision memorandum directing the Navy to establish the program and requesting NN NNSA support for the warhead development. Director Ruby, your administration has a lot on its plate right now. You currently have five warhead modernization programs underway and now a potential sixth with the uh, Slickum N. In an open hearing, um, which we're in today, can you comment on how much extra burden the development of a W80-4 alternate warhead puts on your workforce and budget? Yeah, thank you, Senator Kelly. Uh, we uh, did, uh, obviously, there was NDAA language on Slickum uh, in, and there was an appropriation in 24. So uh, we are working hard on Slickum in, uh, in concert with the Navy. Uh, and we're looking at um, W80-4 and potentially other warheads uh, that will be least disruptive to the program of record and do the job that we need to do uh, consistent with the Navy's se selected platform when, when that's done. So we've established a program office. We're, uh, we're going to work on uh, how to do this so that it will fit in and not disrupt the program of record as best as we can, looking at all options, again, in close coordination with the Navy. Do you uh, prioritize these programs, like uh, 
Absolutely. For infrastructure and, and uh, workforce? Uh, uh, well, infrastructure, uh, there's, we have to, we prioritize a lot of things simultaneously. The, the situation we're in is we're uh, uh, modernizing warheads, why we uh, modernize our infrastructure side by side, in some cases in the same building. Uh, and. Uh, we uh, worry about it every day. We concentrate on it every day. Uh, we're making progress, but it is, it's not an ideal situation, uh, but we are certainly uh, committed to doing it and, it's, and, and, and showing progress. Do you, have, do you have pits going in new warheads today? Uh, no, we the first the first new pit that will go into warheads is the W87-1, which is for the Sentinel uh, ICBM. It's the system after the long-range standoff system, uh, but we are on schedule to make pits for that. And then the following weapon, the W93, also needs new pits. And uh, so, when do you when do you believe a, a, a if it's not uh, if we can say it here in an open hearing when when a pit goes into a Sentinel missile? Uh, our, we're scheduled, well, it, it depends on the schedule of the, right now for the W87-1, uh, we'll be marking the 20, 20, 20, yeah, 20, 2031 or 32 is the first production unit for that system. Um, those should have new uh, pits in them. And when will that, and where will that be? Where does that work take place? The pits will be produced at Los Alamos. The assembly will be done at Pantex in Texas. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Kelly. And for the second round, I'll yield for a question to Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, uh, Secretary Granholm, I want to give you a chance to answer the question from uh, the senator from Missouri. Why, was the, why were we working on a worldwide effort to release oil from strategic petroleum reserves uh, after the invasion of Ukraine? Because um, after the invasion, and rightfully so, so many countries put sanctions on Russian oil, their Russian oil was taken off the market, which caused a huge supply crunch. Which and in turn would cause a huge price spike, is that correct? Which in, in turn causes a huge price spike, which explains in last, uh, or the June before, in June of 2022, why the prices were close to $5 uh, a gallon, is because purely because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was happening across the world, uh, and everyone, uh, at least at the uh, um, International Energy Agency, wanted to see if people who had, uh, countries that had stockpiles could release. So, so this was what the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was for, was to release at a time when there was a worldwide crisis in energy supply in some way in order to stabilize the market, is that correct? Precisely. Thank you. Um, to, to get back to uh, nuclear power and, and the NNSA, I'm concerned about uranium, and we're still buying uranium from Russia, and we don't have much, if any, enrichment capacity for future needs for the submarine fleet, for uh, small modular reactors. Where are we, Administrator, on developing uh, capacity to for uh, uranium supply? If there's anything we've learned in the last... 10 years, it's that we shouldn't be depending on Russia for uh, essential, an essential commodity like uranium. Uh, yeah, thanks, Senator. Uh, well, the, uh, we have, <clears throat> we're trying to coordinate across the department. We have a coordinated plan across the department for uranium, for, both for defense needs and for civil needs. Uh, the civil needs are for uh, LEU, for our current operating reactors, and also for high assay LEU for the advanced reactor program. And Secretary Granholm has mentioned in the hearing that uh, the money that has been allocated to the, appropriated to the department to use to help spur domestic uranium enrichment is dependent on a ban on, on Russian uranium. And so uh, as a department, we're, uh, we're anxious to see that happen. From a, defense per, uh, from a defense needs perspective, if we can start uh, enriching uh, uranium, and specifically high assay, low enriched uranium in the US using all domestic supplies, 
that will become a very important feed material to us for naval reactors to produce a highly enriched uranium I'm in the have future. To, I'm going to move on to another question, but the point is we need to develop a, a domestic capacity yeah. for, for the production of uranium and enrichment uh, and not be dependent upon Russia. Is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Madam Secretary, waste disposal, uh, not Yucca Mountain, just so Catherine Cortez Masto doesn't uh, <laughs> uh, get, come down on me. But on the other hand, we now have what amount to 100 high-level nuclear waste sites scattered around the country, one of which is in Maine where there's stranded nuclear waste from a commercial plant that's, that's, that's there. This is all over the country. Where are we in the search for a more permanent, uh, secure solution to that problem? Yes, thank you for that question. The, um, we have uh, begun a consent-based siting process across uh, the country. We have, to that end, funded 12 different consortia who are having conversations with communities that might be willing to raise their hand, of course, depending on the how the community is compensated for the service of uh, disposing safely of nuclear waste. So there's three phases to it. We are in the first phase. Uh, the second phase will be identifying actually and talking to the volunteers. The first phase is sort of laying the groundwork. And the third phase is actually beginning um, the storage process. So, this so follows that process is actively underway. Actively underway right now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Jill Rann, uh, I'll yield for one question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Granham, I want to thank you for visiting the Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island, where our new electron ion collider is being constructed. I think these national labs are playing such an important role um, for our national security. And I want to um, invite you to perhaps come see at the University of Rochester's Laboratory for Laser Energy the work they're doing there for the National Nuclear Security Administration's inertial confinement fusion program. Um, it, w it has already helped achieve major fusion ignition breakthroughs uh, December 2022. As DOE builds off of that historic milestone and continues to work towards a future powered in part by fusion energy, what role do you see labs like Rochester's Laboratory for Laser Energetics, as well as the Brookhaven National Lab, are playing in your vision uh, for our Department of Energy, but also for our nation's security. Yeah, thank you for that. We have obviously a bold decadal vision to achieve commercial fusion within 10 years. Um, the fusion uh, strategy that's being um, deployed at Rochester is with lasers. Obviously, there's others, magnets, uh, the uh, Los Alamos uh, National, excuse me, not Los Alamos, uh, Lawrence uh, Livermore National Lab is the lab, um, obviously, that did achieve uh, ignition in December 22 and has achieved ignition multiple times after that, by the way. Thanks for the partnership. Those These partnerships are critical. The tools are critical. These user facilities are absolutely fundamental. The electron ion collider is so exciting. It's the first collider that will be built in the next 10 to 20 years globally uh, to be able to determine what is uh, in inside of a proton uh, and how you can um, collide and spin and create perhaps and understand the you know the strongest force in uh, in physics and so it's very exciting what is happening in New York and thanks to uh, New York State for actually having contributed a hundred million dollars to that electron ion collider as well Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you. Uh, Madam Administrator, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will adjourn the open hearing and reconvene uh, as close to 11 a.m. as we can uh, in SVC 217. Thank you very much. <laughs>